going to get this word out this morning. I believe that God has a purpose for this word this morning, and uh, we want to share it. I want to kind of put it in context for you, though. Uh, on a slightly aside, this week has been one of those, I don't know whether you want to call it a weird week or what, uh, but it was a, a, a different kind of week. Uh, started off with having to have some... Uh, some dental work, and then that didn't go the way we thought it was going to go, and uh, turned a bit a little rougher than it was was thought to be. And then I get home and I find out on Wednesday that one of my childhood friends suddenly died, and and uh, so we were kind of processing through that. And then the next morning, I get a call and find that my beloved pastor, uh, Dr. Reese, passed on Thursday morning. And so it's been one of those weeks, uh, Pastor Reese is the pastor of the church I grew up in, uh, and uh, just a beloved man of God. And so was my buddy Carl. So two, two great men, but uh, Dr. Reese having passed was, was a significant transition. Uh, just a great man. Uh, one of those rare historical figures that we have in American history that I had the privilege of knowing and, uh, and growing up with. So to see him pass is rather iconic in that um, he's one of the last members of the great civil rights movement. And that, um, so a very, very serious man in history that God used to change the course of American history and to change my life as well. So I had the privilege of knowing him and it was just funny because in studying the book of Deuteronomy now as we're coming to the end uh, of Moses' earthly life and I begin to wonder, uh, what it was like for them to see Moses step off the stage. And I kind of get a feeling as we watch Dr. Reese step off the stage and see the next generation uh, step firmly forward in that uh, to see those kind of iconic people pass on. But we see that God is still God. And that brings me back into the light of what we were going to talk about today and, and the fact that we serve a very practical God. And the reason I've been thinking about that lately is because as I think about life in the context of its journeys, its ebbs and flows, there are a lot of situations that come across our path. Uh, some that bring us delight and joy and others that bring uh, trial and tribulation along with them. And I began to think uh, along those lines about the practicality of serving God. And that if we don't serve God, of the things we say about God do not apply in the times of the storms of our lives, then they're not real. If they don't apply when the night of your life comes, then it's not real. If it only works for you when everything is going well, when there's no sickness or disease in your body, there's no trouble of mind, there's no loss of loved ones, when everything is working right, if that's the only time your faith stands, then you don't really have any faith. And the God that you are serving is not worth serving. But I began to think again about the context of the God that we, we serve. And I looked at him in the light of the revelation, how he reveals himself to us in the lives of the people that he chooses to use as a sounding board. And I see very flawed people. I see very human people people who are going through situations that are very real, that are very similar to what we are going through today. And yet, those who did it correctly or found success found that it was right and good to serve God in a practical manner. So today I wanna to talk to you about the 10 Commandments. And as New Testament Christians, we have uh, the dismissive attitude of saying things like, well, we don't live under the law and all that kind of stuff. But I want to bring us back to the fact, fact that our God is a very practical God. He's never said or done anything that didn't have eternal purpose. There's nothing that God did that is meant to be discarded. To build upon, yes, but not discarded. So we, we have to check ourselves when we think sometimes about, well, that's, that's the law, we don't have to worry about it. We look at what Paul said in Romans chapter 7, if you found your first reference there, it should be Romans chapter 7, verse 12, where Paul is talking about the law, and he says very succinctly, he said, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and it is just, and it is good. 
So when we think about the law, I don't want us to start thinking about something that, well, that was for them old people in the Old Testament, we can just get rid of it now. No, the law is good. The law is holy. And the law is just. And the law is for us. Now, the beauty of it is, is that we're not, nobody was ever able to live under the law in the sense of fulfilling the law. The only person that ever did that was Jesus Christ. But the beauty that we have as believers is that we get to live out in the fulfillment of Christ's work. So that comes to us if we look at the principle that's applied to us that we have uh, given to us in James, the book, uh, book of James in chapter 2. He's talking about works of faith. And he says there, starting in verse 17, verse 17 and 18, he says, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me that faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. So we come again and we say, as we're looking at the law, it's not going to be a question of my working and my making it happen. It's going to be a question of am I submitted to God in faith, allowing the finished work of Christ to work through me so that the law, the benefits of the law being fulfilled is being worked out in me. So many times what we have as believers is what I call we have that those doctrines of, of mediocrity. We have the high standard of God, this perfection that God has given us, and it is by his very design above us. It is outside of our reach by its very design because it is perfect and we are not. However, Christ has come along and fulfilled the requirements of the cross, uh, a requirement of the law, so that now we, through his sacrifice on the cross, can obtain the righteousness of God, which is in Christ Jesus. The point that we have to understand is, is that these principles apply and are for our good. When we now approach this, 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 these principles of living in the person of Christ, not only are they obtainable in Jesus, but now we have the benefit that they offer us. In the same way, we may take a very practical example. Uh, you may uh, come to my house, you may, be, be, you may go out, let's say we're going out, and you, you, you don't have a credit card, you don't have a debit card because you don't believe in the system. You may have all this money in the bank but without a system or a tool that you can access those giftings, you're practically broke. Does that make sense to you? Even though the money is in your account, without some mechanism upon which to withdraw those funds, you are practically broke. You can starve to death while being a millionaire if you cannot access the funds. Now this principle which God has given us is the mechanism in which we are allowed to access the funds the grace, the economy of heaven. Now, what I want you to understand about that is this, and I'll jump slightly ahead of myself to give a foundation. What is the purpose of the law? What is the purpose of the law? We hear it said, quite jokingly, I heard it about 30 years ago now, maybe longer than that, it's before I met my wife, so 37 years ago now minister was preaching when he said if it was God's purpose just to get you to heaven, he'd save you and kill you. So there is something more that God desires of us than just our transformation. And that we will find is the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law is so that you and I can grow up in Christ Jesus. The purpose of the law is so that we can come close to God, understanding his character so that we know who he is. When we say stuff like God is holy, the Bible defines for us what that means, what that looks like. And then he shows us our character to that same law so we understand that we are not holy. And so in order for the unholy to be with the holy, we have to have that mechanism. Now the Bible tells us quite plainly in the, in the letter of the Hebrews that Jesus through his flesh open a new and living way that we can have access to the Father. But that is just a pathway. It does you no good if you don't walk it. The way is open, but it does you no good if you don't go through that door. And so many times we as believers, we get saved, but we don't go through the door. We'll see that demonstrated here in the lives of, of the Jews here in the nation of Israel 
And we'll look for the comparison in our own lives today. So everybody, we were, we're together now, so let's pray over this word. Now, Father, I just thank you again for the power of your word. I thank you for the liberty and the life that is found in your word. And Father, I'm asking you now to, to overcome the inadequacies of this, your servant, to convey the truth and the principle of your word. Open the hearts of your people. They may receive this word, Lord, and, and find the truth of it and the reality of it so that we can walk in nearness with you. That, Father, we can take full advantage of the sacrifice and the way that you made open for us. We ask your blessing be upon us now in Jesus' name. Amen. So my premise to you is this, is that God gave us the law for the purpose that we might know him better. And in our walking out the tenets of that law is how we have relationship with him. So let's go back to the beginning. Let's look at the context in which the law was given and how God established it. Let's go to Exodus chapter 20 first. We'll look at the giving of the law. Exodus chapter 20, we'll look at verses 1 through 21. It won't take long. It's a very familiar set of scriptures. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto the thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, and in, thou, in it thou shalt do no, shall do not, not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy maidservant, or thy manservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is there in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you. And that his fear may be before your faces that you sin not. And the people stood afar off and Moses drew near and the thick darkness was God, where God was. Now, let's look at the context of what we have going on here. We have to remember when we found the nation of Israel here, they were not the nation of Israel. They were a people group related by culture, custom, but they were slaves bound to the king of the world, Egypt. They were living according to the rules of the king of this world. Through labor, through forced labor, through the very existence of their life, they used their life resources to build the worlds, the system of the kings of the world. Everything they did was unto the kings of this king of this world. So when we see God come in to rescue the nation of Israel, he's not coming to them because they have any great gift to offer him. They're not coming to him. He's not coming to them because he sees something so fantastic in them that he goes, I got to have that. The Bible is very clear that God came and took the nation of Israel, drew them unto himself because of two reasons. One, because he loved them. And two, because he had promised a covenant with their fathers. So God's rescue and delivery of them had nothing to do with them. When they came out of Egypt, it's very important to understand this. When they came out of Egypt and the blood was shed, the blood was shed, the Passover lamb was sacrificed, the blood was placed on the house, and the death angel went through Egypt, and the nation of Israel was set aside. The next morning they came out alive. 
They came out of bondage. They came out of Egypt now under the blood covenant with God. And now they're going out through the wilderness. They go through the Red Sea. You know the story of how they fought the Amalekites and everyone else. They went through all these things. But we find out that when we look at this, God tells them a couple of things really important. He says, remember the day of the Passover. Teach it to your sons and your sons' sons. And make sure when you get to the promised land that they look and they say, how do we get here? What happened? You explain to them that this was done because of the blood. Now, what is very telling to me in this, remember we come back to God chose them because he loved them. God chose you because he loves you. Not because you have any merit to offer him. In the epistle of 1 John, he gives us this, these two clues in verse, chapter 4, verse 10, and then again in verse 19. I'll reference them real quick for you. He says, herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. In verse 19, he says, we love God because he first loved us. So this is where we have to start. We don't come to God because one day we are looking at ourselves and say, man, I need to fix this mess I'm in. We don't come to God because one day we look at God and say, he is so wonderful, he is so beautiful. No, we come to God because he comes after us. He touches us with the awareness of his presence and makes us to know that we need a savior. He shows us the condition of our soul and then in understanding the condition of our soul, we respond to his love. That's why we come. So in the likewise, now we think about the establishing of the law. Why did God give us this law? Because he wanted us to know him. He wanted us to know him. Now we talk about this idea of what it was like in Egypt. Now let's, let's I know we don't like to do this too often, but let's do it just for a moment. Take a moment and remember yourself before you were saved. Remember the conditions of Egypt. Remember the confusion of your minds, the lust of your flesh, the way you were driven to build the kingdoms of the God of this world. Chasing money, chasing sex, chasing relationships, chasing power, chasing recognition, doing all these things that we do, building the kingdoms, the cities of Pharaoh. And as we built those kingdoms, those cities of Egypt, there were those around us who saw the work that we were doing and they were enticed by their own lust and drawn into bondage under Pharaoh. And then we became part of the system that helped keep other people in bondage to sin by encouraging them to participate in sin with us. God describes Egypt as the iron furnace. You know, when you take raw metal into a furnace, you begin to melt it down, you, you, you're cooking, you put on intense heat, there's pressure. It's all for the purpose of change and conformity. When we were in the world, the enemy applied pressure to our lives. He applied pressure to our consciousness to get us to conform to the world. The Holy Spirit through Paul tells us in the New Testament, Romans, what? Be not conformed. Because in that iron furnace, Satan doesn't want you to be anything other than what he has uh, led you to be. And we see this here. If you open your Bibles again to New Testament, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm just kind of laying a foundation because we're going to be spending the next few sessions as I get a chance to speak to you about the Ten Commandments. But it's very important that we understand again why the Ten Commandments were given and what was the context in which they were given. It's not just about you being saved. So that's why it's so easy for us in the New Testament to say, you know, we don't have to deal with the law. We can cast the law aside because now we got the New Testament. And that's true if you understand the context. If you don't understand the context, it's like having money in the bank and no debit card. You have all the resources, you just can't access them because you don't know how. You don't have the access code. So looking back to Egypt, we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's look, read at verse 9 through 11. The apostle writes, and he says, this is from the easy to read version. He says, surely you know that people who do wrong will not get to enjoy God's kingdom. Don't be fooled. These are the people who will not get to enjoy his kingdom. Those who sin sexually, 
those who worship idols, those who commit adultery, men who let other men use them for sex or who have sex with other men, those who steal, those who are greedy, those who drink too much, those who abuse others with insults and those who cheat. In the past, some of you were like that, but you were washed clean, you were made holy, and you were made right with God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. What is he saying? He says at one time, you guys were all in bondage in Egypt. At one time, you were all in Egypt. Now, you didn't do all the things on that list, but you only had to do one. You didn't do all those things on the list, but you did some of them. He said, but now you have come out. And how have you come out? By the virtue of your own will? No. Did you come out because you got sick and tired of Egypt and you want to change a venue? No. You came out because Jesus drew you out. He washed you and he cleansed you by the power of his blood. And he keeps you by the power of his spirit. But here is the problem. When we came out of Egypt, we came out of Egypt in the same way that the Jews came out of Egypt. We have to not romanticize it, but see it for what it is. When the nation of Israel came out of Egypt and they were formed, naturally formed into a nation, they knew about God. They knew stories about God. They heard of people who used to live a long time ago who walked with God. But they didn't know God. They didn't have a great relationship with God. They came out of Eva, a nation of idol worshipers. Remember how quickly they turned to idol worship at the foot of the mountain? So quickly they turn at the foot of the mountain. Why? Because it was in them already. Moses is up on the mountain communing with God, getting the Ten Commandments. What are they doing? They're building idols of gold and having orgies at the foot of the mountain. Moses came back and said, it sounds like war in the camp. And God said, it's not war. It's those people. See, they didn't know God. So God brings them out. He gives them the law, but he brings them to the foot of the mountain. And this, this day of appointment finally comes. And they're at the foot of the mountain. And they have been prepared against that day. And so the day finally comes where God manifests himself on the top of the mountain. And he draws the people to him to give them these Ten Commandments. And you would think that here these people are that came out and they're like, oh my goodness, here is God. He's given us the access code to the debit account. I can now draw on this account and have a relationship with him. But what did they do? They shrunk back. They pulled back. They stepped away from him. Why did they step away from him? Because their nature, their nature, you see, they didn't know God. They didn't have a relationship with God. They were his people. They were covered in the blood. They were brought out of Egypt, but they didn't know him. And so many of us don't know him. We know about him. We've heard what people say, what God did with the old heads and how God moved through this generation and through that generation. We heard about this story over there and that story over there, but we don't know him. So when he draws us out, he gives us the law and he says, this is how you will get to know me. See, this is the purpose of the law. It's so that you and I can have a relationship with God because guys, man, Having been created in the image of God is a very fantastic creature. I heard one physicist explain it this way. He was talking about the universe and the fact that the universe is knowable. That you can sit here on the ground in Nampa, Idaho, and calculate how much time and fuel it would take to reach the planet Mars. Why? Because the universe is knowable. You can sit here, look at the sun, and calculate, based on certain truths of science, how hot the sun is burning. Why? Because the universe is knowable. You can stand on Earth and calculate and tell me how much the Earth weighs. How can you do that? Because the Earth is knowable. The earth is knowable because there was a creator and a designer that built those principles into it. He gave us the keys to which we can know these things because the Bible tells us plainly that the heavens declare the glory of God. So when we look at them appropriately, we can see the hand of the creator in them. But you can't discern God. 
You can't sit down with paper and pen and figure out God. You can't think in yourself and go, mm, I think I got it. No, it doesn't work that way. The only way you and I can know God is through the vehicle of revelation. He has, being the greater, has revealed himself to us, being the lesser. And once he shows himself to us, he then has to come and show us the way to have a relationship with him. It's not enough for God to say, I am holy. We can look at that and say, oh gosh, he's separate, he's different than us. But now he gives us a process in which we can have relationship with him. And this, my brother, my sister, is the purpose of the law. Think back to how Jesus described it. In the New Testament, when he's being confronted by one of the many who were challenging him, and he said, Master, what is the greatest law of all? What is the greatest law then? And everybody who goes to Friday Night Bible says, should know this one by heart. Matthew 22, 37 through 40. What does it say? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. What's the purpose of the law? That you should love God. What's the outward working, the function of the law? That I should love my neighbors as I love myself. So when we start thinking about the law, what's the purpose of the law? The purpose of the law is to teach me how to love God. You see, when we look at it that way, how sensible it is for us to say, well, we're not under the law. Well, we don't need to know God. We don't need to know how to have a relationship with God. We can just cast that off now. Jesus died for us and that's enough. What an insult to the grace of God. What did Jesus say in his high priestly prayer in John 17? He said, glorify thou the Son as I come back to you now, Father, and I've come that they may have eternal life. And how did he describe eternal life? Living forever? What did he say? Anybody remember? He said, what? To know the Father. This is eternal life, that they might know you and know Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So if we were to just get saved, you can get saved and stay a baby forever and never really know God. But if you're going to know God, it's because you diligently seek after him. And if you're going to come after God, there's a mechanism in place by which you have to come. And we'll talk about this a lot more going forward, but let's go on because I'm just laying the foundation tonight. We said here in Matthew chapter 22 that the great law is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength to come into that place where we're walking with him. Now, here is the part I want to kind of give you as a hint's pen. Jesus lays down a principle for us that we, especially the westernized church, have a tendency to ignore. When talking to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, uh, and he's revealing to her that he is the Messiah, he says something very key to her. What verse is that? In verse 22, John chapter 4, verse 22, he says, you Samaritans worship something you don't understand. We Jews understand what we worship since salvation comes from the Jews. What is he telling us, church? He's telling us that God has given us the principles and the ways to know him. It didn't come through the, through, through the Arabs. It didn't come through the Baptists. It didn't come through the, through the Methodists. It didn't come through the Catholics. Okay? That was one revelation that he gave us. And that was through the Jewish revelation. That's what he's telling us. This is how he has prescribed that we should know him. Not that we got to be Jewish. I'm not saying that. That's not the point here. But the law, the principle of coming to knowing him, those steps that it takes. Jesus said, let's look at, let's get, let's break down this foundation so we can, we'll, we'll leave it here until next time. Jesus says we're to love him with all our heart, mind, soul. We're to love the Lord our God. That's the first command, to love our God. So what does he mean when he says love? If you look at it, just look at it in context. Again, going back to the tradition, it means to love God in that moral or social sense. It's to hold God in the highest esteem. It's to hold God in high reverence, to honor him as God. Not to be casual. 
Not to look at God as being one of our partners, one of our peers, one of our homies. No, no. No, God is God. So when we love God is to recognize God as God. That's the first thing we have to do is recognize God as God. You're not going to get anywhere past that if we don't understand that first step. We must recognize God and honor God for who he is. And if you want to see what that looks like, look at the examples he's given us in the book. He's teaching us in the book. When we honor God, how do we honor God? How do we reverence God? How do we see God? We see that expression in the book. And then we bring ourselves to God in the uniqueness of who we are and we honor him. We glory in his presence. We hold him in the highest esteem. We don't treat him casually. I mean, it's such a contradiction on one hand that even now, whether you're Republican or Democrat, if the president walked into this room, you would have a certain amount of honor and respect that you'd show him. But too many times we as believers can approach God and think about God in the most casual terms without honoring him for who he is. Moses talked to God face to face, and yet he always managed to hold God in the highest esteem. How did that happen? Because he knew God. Not some facsimile of God, but he knew who God was. And therefore, he was able to honor him for who he was. Secondly, he tells us the second component of that is to love God with all our hearts. Quite literally, that means with our thoughts and with our feelings and with our mind. With our thoughts, with our feelings and with our mind to love God. This is one of those things where it comes back, we double up on it, but we look at this, we understand that, guys, you are human by design. I know this sounds kind of stupid, but it's true. You're human by design. God made you human. He gave you the faculties of your mind and your body and your spirit. And he intended that you use those to love him. So we come to him with all our, our, our mind, our thoughts, our feelings. And then he says to love him with our soul. The spirit, the breath, the sentient part of ourselves. The human part of ourselves. Not looking forward to some day in the yet future, guys, where we're going to be, once I'm changed, once I'm converted, then I'm going to really love God. Once I get to heaven, I'm going to really love God. No, no. Love God with who you are now. Who are you? Who did God make you to be? What skills, what talents, what abilities do you have today? And how are you using those to love God? How are you using them to love God? Are you squandering them on your own self, using them for your own glory? Or are you using yourself, your ability, your personhood to honor God? Everything you do, the Bible, see, and it makes sense when you put it in the light of the New Testament. What did Paul says? Whatever you do, do what? As unto the Lord. Everything you do, as unto the Lord. If I'm going to work, as unto the Lord. If I'm going fishing, as unto the Lord. Glorify God in what you do and who you are. How do I do that? That's where your mind comes in. Remember he said to love God with your mind? Lord, how do I use this for your glory? Lord, how do I express glory to you in this? How do I live in this for you? I'm going to purposefully love God. We're not just going to bump along and let things happen. I'm going to, with design, give my life to God. I'm going to pursue after him. And finally says, now with the mind. And sometimes this is the one part that we get in trouble here in the church. Can we think if something originates in our mind, that makes us wrong. If I come up with a good idea, that must be the flesh. That must be evil. If I'm putting together a song, and I say, well, let's do this in four part harmonies. Everybody, let's do it just right. Somehow we see that as oppressive. How is it that we can give our best to everything but God? Use your mind. Use your imagination. This is what he means when he says to love God with all your heart, mind, soul. And everything you have, give your best to God. 
Don't give God our leftovers and say, well, God's God, he'll take it. But if I'm going to stand before the state board and take a test, I'm going to really study for that one. How backwards is that? Let's give God our best. So in bringing this to a close, like I said, we're going to look at each one of these story next time. I'm going to break down the law again, give them that context in it and, and why God gave us the law. Remembering, if you can remember this one point, it'll give you the foundation to build on. The purpose of the law is to show you and I how to have relationship with God. It's so that we will understand how to have relationship with God. You know, one of the classes I teach for state is culture diversity. And it's amazing that you have to teach people how to relate to people in different cultures. There's things that I can do as a Western man in a Western culture that I don't have to think twice about. But in other cultures, I did, it would be a major, major mess up. So I have to learn, if I go into this culture, do I go shake this young lady's hand? Do I grab this young single lady and give her a hug? Do I walk up to this little kid and grab top of his head and say, how you doing, son? Some cultures you do that and you've just insulted anything and everybody. So I have to learn how to have a relationship in that culture. And that's human. But what you and I have been invited to do is have a relationship with someone who's altogether different than we are. He's inviting us to come into a place where we are complete strangers. And he's going to teach us how to have a relationship with him. And if we are wise and humble enough to accept his instruction, then we will enhance our relationship. And you will find this thing called Christianity transform into a deeper, more intimate relationship with God. And it's not because of works, not because of your works, it's because of the work of the cross. Not because of your righteousness, but because of the righteousness of God that's given to us through Christ Jesus. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fill it. And now you and I have the privilege of being to put on Christ and walk in the completeness of his work if we will just take his invitation. So let's pray over that word, please. Gracious Father, again, I just thank you and I praise you, Lord, for the cross. I thank you, Lord, that indeed it is higher than I am. Your ways are not my ways. Your, you told us that your ways are higher than mine. Your thoughts are higher than mine. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so when I come to you, Father, I can't come to you in my ways. We can't come to you, Lord God, in the confines of our thoughts. If we're going to have relationship with you, we're going to have to come the way you told us. So I'm asking you, Father, help each one of us today to come back to you, come closer to you, Lord God, to surrender ourselves to you to recognize you as being the God of not only ourselves, of all creation, but you are also the God who's opened the way that we might have relationship with you. Help us now to take advantage of this gift. Breathe upon us, strengthen us by your Holy Spirit. Empower us, Lord God, that we might know you and that we might be like it says in Daniel, I think it is, Lord, that we will do exploits. Not because we're so bad, but because you're so good. And we thank you for it in the name of Jesus. You know, as we close out, church, I want to give you this invitation that if you are sitting here, you don't know the Lord Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. This whole thing called the law will also stand in judgment against you. Because the very things that God teaches us how to have relationship with him are the things that keep us out if we don't do them correctly. We don't come to him in Christ. So if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then come and let the law work for you rather than have the law stand against you. How do you do that? You simply ask, Lord, forgive me for my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me and that his blood covers my sins and that by asking and receiving Lord you do cleanse me and forgive me and make me your own 
We simply ask. And once we do that, then the work, the fulfilling of the law that Jesus did on the cross is applied to our case. The requirements of the law are fulfilled. And then it's up to you and I to come into knowing him, come into intimacy with him. If you are a believer and you've been walking outside of intimacy with God, you've been perhaps doing it on your own or trying, whatever the case may be, whatever your confusion has been, it doesn't matter. If you are outside of that intimacy with God, I want to invite you to come. Let us pray with you today. Let us stand with you in prayer today. Simply to ask that God would fill you again with his Holy Spirit. That he would empower you with his strength. Because I'm here to tell you that God that I serve is a practical God. He holds us through the dark of night. He holds us through the pains of a broken heart. He is able to keep us. We just have to come. So we open the altar to that invitation. We invite you to come. If you have any other need, come. And we'll pray with you on that as well. But come. In the name of Jesus, amen.